Two things struck me about people's reaction to my video last week. First, people were entirely unimpressed by the fact that I learned how to read a micrometer. My accomplishment was met with a deafening absence of accolades. And second, people were surprisingly curious about the 3D graphics of the micrometer that I used in the tutorial section. And most of them were a little bit surprised to find out that I made them myself from scratch. So today we're going to talk about the process that I went through of creating those graphics. For as long as I can remember, I have been fascinated by 3D graphics and animation. In the late 90s, I actually started to dabble a little myself. I got my hands on various pieces of 3D software, some more legitimately than others, and started to try my hand at creating 3D scenes. Playing with that software only reinforced for me the incredible complexity of not only the software, but the process of creating 3D animations. Even today, movies like Toy Story are incredibly impressive to look at. And when you figure in the fact that it was made in 1995, it makes it all the more incredible a feat to have accomplished. Suffice to say, the industry has come an incredible way in the intervening 25 years, and there are entire YouTube channels devoted to cataloging that evolution, so I'm not even going to try. On the other hand, there are very few YouTubers better suited to cataloging my own 20-year experience dabbling in the world of 3D. Not to give the wrong impression, but my 20-year journey has not been a slow march towards competency. Instead, it was about 19.9 years of incompetently creating spheres and teapots in 3D software and then rendering them, followed by a solid month of intense study to try to learn how to create something useful. And this last month of intense progress has been primarily driven by, of course, an endless stream of YouTube videos about how to effectively use Blender, which I've mentioned a few times previously on this channel is an incredible piece of free open source software. It's much more than even a 3D modeling and animation software. It kind of does a little bit of everything, and I don't think that I could even do it justice if I tried to explain all of the things that it does. But one of them is it is an incredibly accomplished 3D modeling software, which is what I used it for most recently. Blender was originally released in 2002, and I am relatively sure that within the first two years of Blender existing, I picked it up during my university days, and at the time it was very different than it is today, and to say the least, it has come an incredible way since then. Today it is professional-grade software capable of creating feature-length animated movies. But, like I said, my journey from Chief Sphere Renderer to Micrometer Modeler started with YouTube, specifically devouring the entire back catalog of a channel called Blender Guru. And that name may sound familiar, because Andrew, aka Blender Guru, was also the person who educated me on NFTs that was eventually the reason that I created that video on art that was definitely not about NFTs. But his tutorials definitely lived up to the guru moniker, and by the time I had watched all of them, some of them probably twice, I was absolutely hooked on the idea of using Blender to do some cool stuff. I was also completely ill-prepared to actually do anything with Blender, but the foundation and excitement was 100% in place. Andrew also pointed me in the direction of Ian Hubert, a staggeringly talented 3D animator who was 
doing YouTube shorts before YouTube shorts were a twinkle in the eye of the cool kids that are doing them today. His work is on a whole other level. But enough fawning over talented 3D artists. At this point, I've watched probably a hundred hours of Blender tutorials and modeled one lumpy micrometer. So surely I'm ready to create a tutorial of my own, right? Clearly not. But that won't stop me from talking about the process that I went through to create said lumpy micrometer, because I think it's really cool. No, 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 no. Not that type of digital micrometer. I, I meant the type that lives in a file, uh, never mind. Anyway, the first lesson in my journey of becoming a 3D modeler, I won't use any other superlatives there, was that it's all about the references, specifically reference imagery. So in this particular case, I had the good fortune of tangibly owning the object that I was trying to model. But even in that case, taking a set of photographs from specific angles was incredibly important to starting me on the journey of modeling it. Specifically, I took photos of the micrometer from all of the orthogonal vantage points. So straight down on top, straight from the bottom, straight from the left side, right side, front, and back. As much as possible, I wanted perfect straight on views, but that isn't always easy. In fact, usually I did a pretty bad job of it. Once I had these images, I imported them into Blender as planes and aligned them as if they were a box around the place where I was going to model my micrometer. Once I had the box, really all I had to do was trace the 3D outline from every different angle within the box in order to create the part inside of it. I was essentially tracing the images on each face. Then just say it. You're a tracer. Ignoring whether I'm a tracer or not, the one trick that I did that I think paid off huge for me in the long run was I opened the jaws of the micrometer to exactly half an inch. And by doing that, I had a reference of scale that I could align all of the images to to make sure that a half an inch in Blender space mapped perfectly to a half an inch in all of the images that I had taken. The first step of modeling anything seems to be determining what primitives make up that particular object. What is that object most closely related to? As an example, if you are modeling a coffee cup, you might recognize that a coffee cup is a lot like a cylinder. In 3D software, primitives are things like planes, cubes, spheres, monkey heads, toruses, etc. Luckily for me, much like a coffee cup, a micrometer is basically just a series of cylinders. And the only really tricky part of the geometry is the curved arc that makes up the frame of the micrometer. My approach to making the frame was to start with a cylinder, I know, mild shock, and then grab a handful of the faces on the bottom edge of it, and then extrude, rotate, and scale them over and over again in an arcing pattern until I looped back around to where I wanted to end up. Once I was done with that, I could bevel the sharp corners that I had created, making a satisfyingly lumpy arc that vaguely resembled the beautiful smooth arc of my micrometer. The only other tricky piece of geometry was the knurling on the thimble and ratchet knob of the micrometer. But to no one's surprise, there is a tutorial for how to do knurling in Blender. The Cliff Notes version of it is that you start with a cylinder, and then you subdivide that cylinder along the walls of the cylinder until you end up with a mesh of squares. Then you take those squares and you do what's called pin the faces. It's an operation that puts a vertex at the center of each one of those squares. Then you use another command called tries to quads that attempts to take triangles and convert them into squares. 
And when you call that on it, it converts all of those triangles that you just created into vertical diamonds. As a side note, this step I learned only works if you have applied the transforms in Blender. If you use Blender, you'll know what that means. But once you've created these beautiful diamonds, then you can pin those faces again and extrude the center vertex out, and you end up with tiny little diamond pyramids popping out of your surface. Very, very satisfying. I'll leave the full tutorial that I used in the description in case anyone's curious. The only other gotcha that I ran into with the knurling is that the subdivision step has you making squares, and the number of squares that you make depends on the number of faces that your cylinder's walls have. So me, being the lazy person that I am, I used the same copy of a cylinder for all the different parts of my micrometer, and so they all had the number of faces, which meant that the knurling on things like the ratchet knob ended up significantly smaller than the knurling on the thimble, which had a much larger diameter. But with all that said and done, at this point we had modeled a micrometer. It's a weird matte gray color, and it's a bit lumpy, but it's ours. Upon careful examination of the actual micrometer, I was able to determine that it is not in fact made out of gray silly putty, but it's actually made out of metal. Fixing this was as easy as adding a material to the component parts of the micrometer, and then tweaking the metallic slider on that material until the micrometer looked sufficiently shiny and metal. Ish. Not exactly rocket science, I'll admit, but things did manage to get a little more interesting from here. You see, a micrometer with no writing on it would be exceedingly worthless both for measuring and tutorialization. To complicate things even a little further, the text isn't just painted on the surface, it's actually etched into the surface of the metal. But we'll address that in a second. First, we just wanted to get the writing on the object. And for that, the first thing that I did was fire up GIMP and create a set of transparent and black images that contained all of the hash marks and numbers that we would need to show up on our model. In total, I made three images, one for the frame, one for the sleeve, and one for the thimble. I created a transparent and black, and a black and white version of each of these images. Now, the process of applying a 2D image to a 3D object is not trivial. The process for turning a 3D object into something that a 2D image can be mapped onto is generally referred to as UV unwrapping. And essentially what you're doing in this process is you're laying out each of the polygonal faces of the model that you have on a flat surface, and then underneath that placing the image texture that you want laid out over the object. So for me, it was all about identifying the parts of the model that needed to have hash marks on them, and then figuring out how to lay those down over the hash marks in the appropriate scale. One trick that helped me, especially with the frame, is the fact that Blender has something called limited dissolve. It's a deletion method where rather than deleting parts of your geometry, it only merges coplanar faces. So what I could do was take the U-shaped surface that was one of the sides of the frame and use limited dissolve to turn that into a single, very complex polygon that I could then overlay on the text that I had created for the frame. It was a fiddly process, but when all was done, I had aligned all of the text on the appropriate parts of the model. And getting back to that scale thing that I was talking about before, the amount that I opened up the jaws of the micrometer, I was able to displace the thimble exactly one inch, and use that to check to make sure that I had perfectly aligned the hash marks on the sleeve. Now that I had all of the textures properly painted onto the object, it was time to address the etching problem that I described before. 
And one way that I could have approached it is much like I approached the knurling problem. I could have created actual geometry, taken the flat plane of the frame and actually created indentations where all the letters were. The problem is, is this would have made our model staggeringly complex. And the cool thing is there's an approach in 3D graphics that is specifically for problems like this, and it's called bump mapping. Bump mapping is the process of adding apparent bumps, for lack of a better word, to flat surfaces using only the lighting engine of a renderer. Not to go too deep, but the basic idea is, is that a flat plane has a normal vector that is perpendicular to its surface. And the lighting engine uses that to determine reflections and how it catches light and all these kinds of things. And bump mapping allows you to use an image to perturb the surface normals so that a flat plane can have many different normals coming off of it that appear like a bumpy surface rather than a flat one. And as a result, using a bump map of the texture that we had created, specifically the black and white one, created the perfect effect, an indentation where each letter was. And I was pretty blown away by the result. I thought it held up to scrutiny even when I was relatively closely zoomed in, and I thought that it looked pretty real to life. And at this point, we were in the home stretch. The object looked correct, and technically if I had wanted to, I could have positioned the thimble and the spindle in the appropriate locations for all of the measurements that we needed to do, and made the tutorial without doing any more work inside of Blender other than tweaking the model. To me, this is the coolest part of the whole process. But before we get into the really, really cool stuff, we're gonna talk briefly about parenting. In Blender, parenting is the idea that any object can be the child of another object kind of hierarchically. And what happens is, is when you change the parent, all of the children and the children's children are also changed in the same way. So if I have one object parented to another object, moving the parent or rotating the parent will also rotate the child at the same time. This is super important to us because it allows us to turn our bundle of next to each other cylinders into an actual single object inside of Blender. Specifically, by parenting the ratchet knob to the thimble, when the thimble turns, the ratchet knob will also turn and it won't kind of look funny or like it's spinning independent of other elements. This works well for simple relationships, but for more complex relationships like the relationship between the spindle and the thimble, we're going to need something a little more advanced to link those two up. And as you might have guessed, that's constraints. Constraints are essentially parenting on steroids and allow you to create constraints between an object and other objects or constraints on an object itself. The first constraint that I created was a simple one that limited the movement of the spindle to be on the x-axis only and back and forth one inch only, just like the micrometer is limited. The second far cooler constraint is the one that linked the spindle and thimble like I was mentioning before. Because you see, every time the spindle travels 25 thousandths of an inch, the thimble needs to rotate 360 degrees. As a, as a quick aside here, I was amazed at the connection of these two processes. I was learning how to use a micrometer and also modeling it in Blender, and the two really fed on one another. The modeling in Blender enriched my understanding of how the micrometer worked, and my understanding of how the micrometer worked enabled me to model it in Blender. It was a, it was a really cool kind of synergy of learning that was going on with this particular project. But back to the constraint. The way that this particular constraint worked is I set on the origin object a set of locations and ranges that I wanted to map to something else, and then on the receiving object I set 
a different range. So in this particular case, the spindle had a 0 to 1 mapping on its x-coordinate, and 0 mapped to 0 degrees on the thimble, and 1 mapped to 14,400 degrees on the thimble. So that essentially created what I was describing before, where every time the spindle moved 0 0.025 inches, the thimble would rotate one time around. And so in total, I needed 40 rotations for the inch, and 40 times 365 is 14,400. I hope. <laughs> in the end, what this meant is that I could move the spindle around, and the thimble would automatically move and rotate appropriate to that movement, just like a micrometer works. And even more impressive, and to my surprise, if I typed in a displacement in Blender, like let's say 0.381 inches, the micrometer at this point in Blender would read exactly the configuration that it should in the real world. That that kind of blew my mind. I had created a working micrometer in Blender, and I thought that was super cool. With that done, I had created my first useful working model in Blender, and I probably spent a few hours just playing with it because, I don't know, the, the novelty took a while to wear off, that it just kept on reading out exactly the way that it should. But this was an incredibly fun and rewarding project, and I hope that you found this little glimpse into the process by which I created those graphics to be somewhat interesting as well. But for now, thank you as always for watching. I hope that you have a wonderful day, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Not a potamus, ponderous.